On our previous discussion about angular motion or rotational motion, we have tried to see about rotational kinematics. We have tried to see about the different equations and tried to solve some examples. And today we'll try to see about the uh, rotational dynamics part. So what is rotational dynamics? Well, rotational dynamics is a concept that we are trying to deal about rotating object exerting a force. And the rotational effect of force is known to be torque. So we'll try to see some of the main uh, terms that is used in rotational dynamics. There are basic terms in rotational dynamics. Among those terms, the two basic terms are moment of inertia and torque. So what are moment of inertia and torque? First, let's try to see about moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is a measure of distribution of mass about a given axis of rotation. It's a measure of distribution of mass of particles around a given axis of uh, rotation. So in this point, we'll try to see about radius. Here it says radius, a key term. Here you have an axis of rotation. Let's take that this is the axis of rotation. About that axis of rotation, you have different mass. Let's say you can take mass one, and at that different mass, you might have a distance r. So when we say r, sometimes it is a distance between a given particle and the axis, and later we'll try to see about the rigid body systems. When we mean by r, we mean that the radius of the object, okay? So when the axis of rotation is through center, mean by radius r and when the axis of rotation is out of the center it's called the distance between the particle and the axis of rotation so here we have two cases to find the moment of inertia of a given objects we should have to classify majorly classify into two the moment of inertia of particle system and the moment of inertia of rigid body system here we have a particle system, moment of inertia of particle system, and moment of inertia of rigid body uh, system. So the moment of inertia of particle system, suppose here you have a particle, a single particle, and that particle is found at a distance of r from the axis of rotation. This is the axis of rotation, and you have a mass m attached at some distance from the axis of rotation. In that distance is called r. Not r means it doesn't mean radius, not always true. In this case, it is a distance. So to find the moment of inertia of a single particle here, you have to have the mass of the particle times r squared. This is how we determine the moment of inertia of a single particle. And the SI unit of moment of inertia can be given as the SI unit of moment of inertia is the SI unit of mass, kilogram. The SI unit of distance is meter, so kilogram meter squared is a SI unit of the moment of inertia. And sometimes it's also possible to have a different particles so that it's possible to find the moment of inertia of a system due to those particles. Well, you should have to use the summation of the moment of inertia of every single particles. Mi's are i's, where i is initialized from 1 up to n. Suppose here you have two particles with different radius r, so the moment of inertia of those system can be given as m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 
squared. The summation of these two gives us the moment of inertia of the system. So this is how we determine the moment of inertia of a particle system. The moment of inertia of solid body systems, or call it rigid body systems, as the axis of rotation is through their center, is already provided in standard physics books. You can find the moment of inertia of a sphere, disk, hoop, cylinder, a bar. The moment of the axis of rotation might be through uh, the center or it might be different place, but we mainly focus as the axis of rotation is through center. It's possible to find on standard physics books. Suppose here you have some of the common of moment of inertia from your textbooks and some books. Here you have cylinder. Okay, you might have a hoop shape. If it is hollow, it's called cylindrical shell, uh, shell or a cylindrical hole. If it is solid, it's called just cylinder. You might have a sphere, okay, or a spherical shell. You might have a bar, and the axis of rotation is through center. Sometimes it might be at the tip or at the end, but we mainly focus while the axis of rotation is through their center. So. Uh, Suppose here you have a sphere. For a sphere, the moment of inertia as the axis of rotation is through center is given to be 2 over 5 m r squared. In this case, r is the radius of the sphere, the radius of the sphere. And you might have the moment of inertia of uh, hoop. Hoop means a ring. Okay, you might have a ring like this. The moment of inertia of a hoop or a ring can be given as m r squared. Okay, mar squared. And if you have the disc, suppose you have a disc or a cylinder, cylinder, the moment of inertia is given to be 1 over 2 mr squared. Okay, and the moment of inertia of a bar of mass m and the length l can be given as 1 over 12 ml squared. So these are the common. This is the moment of inertia of a hoop. Hoop, the other name is ring. The moment of inertia of disc or uh, cylinder, cylinder or disc having the same moment of inertia, 1 over 2 mr squared. And here we do have uh, the moment of inertia of uh, bar, and the axis should be through center, and it's given to be 1 over 12 m l squared. Okay, the length is of the rod squared. And the other question is what if the axis of rotation is different from the center? Suppose you do have a rigid body and the axis is found at different locations than the center. Then to find this, you, sh you should have to use a famous equation or a technique of finding the moment of inertia using a parallel axis theorem. You have a parallel axis theorem so that we can apply this to find the moment of inertia. Suppose here you have a moment of inertia and to find the moment of inertia of this body as the axis is different from the center. The axis, as the axis is through center, as we have previously mentioned, it's possible to find the moment of inertia in standard physics books. You have, as we have mentioned previously, for solid bodies, for different bodies, you do have uh, the moment of inertia as the axis is through center. Now the question is, what if you have another axis? On that axis, the object is tending to rotate, so that how do we determine the moment of inertia? Therefore, you should have to apply the uh, parallel axis theorem. And the parallel axis theorem states that you should have to add the moment of inertia of that body as through center plus md squared. Okay, md squared. Here, d is the distance between the two parallel axes. The distance between the two parallel axes is d. Therefore, the mass of the object times the length between the two uh, parallel axes, d squared. And this is how we determine the moment of inertia of objects, solid objects, as the axis differ from center. Here you have one good example. It says that find the moment of inertia of the rod of having lengths L and mass M. If the axis of rotation is found at exactly one third of the length L. Previously, you have here on the, on this equation, or in this, uh, you have found on standard physics books, the moment of inertia of a bar as the axis found at the tip, at one end, is given to be 1 over 3 times ml squared. You can find this using a parallel axis theorem. That means, suppose here you have a bar 
or a rod and that rod has a length L and mass M. Okay? The axis, as the axis is through center, we call it the moment of inertia of that body through center of mass is given to be 1 over 12 M L squared. Now the question is, if the axis of rotation is found at one end, either here or here, you can have the axis of rotation at this point. Now, what is the moment of inertia? The parallel axis theorem states that it's possible to find the moment of inertia as the moment of inertia of that body through center plus md squared, md squared, where d is the distance between the two parallel axes. Here, the distance between the two parallel axes, generally, this rod has length L in the axis through center and the axis at the end means the distance between the center and the end will be half of the length, okay, length of vertical. Therefore, it's possible to substitute here the moment of inertia of the rod as the axis is through center is known to be 1 over 12 m L squared plus m where d is the distance between the two parallel axes and it's given to be L over 2, the whole squared. When you square this, you have 1 over 12 m L squared plus, when you square this, you have 1 over 4, 2 squared 4, and we have m L squared. So 1 over 12 plus 1 over 4 m L squared as a common, 1 over 12 plus 1 over 4 as a common whole m L squared. You can find this to be 4 over 12, 12 as a common, 4 over 12 ml squared. When you simplify this, simplify this, you can find 1 over 3 ml squared. This is the moment of inertia of a bar as the axis of rotation is found at one end. Okay? And it's already provided in standard physics books, as you have said earlier. This is how we determine. It's possible to use a parallel axis theorem to find the moment of inertia of solid bodies as the axis is found at different locations. So here in this question, it says that it's possible to find the moment of inertia of a rod if the length is found at one third of the length uh, from one end. Here you have the length L. Now the new axis is found one third. Okay, it's found at one third of the one end. For suppose that this is an end. From this, it's found at one third of the length L. So how do we determine the moment of inertia using parallel axis theorem? Well, parallel axis theorem says the moment of inertia through center plus md squared, and d should be the distance between the two parallel axes. From this to this is one third of L, and from center to the end is half of the length of L. So half of the length of L minus one third of the length of L gives us one sixth of the length of L is the distance between the two parallel axis. So instead of D, you can use 1, 6. Okay? So 1 over 12 plus 1, 6 gives us 1 over 4 ml squared. So the other location is if the axis of rotation is found at one side of the length of one of the end of a road, it's possible to find the moment of inertia of such bodies. So you can practice this. As exercise, you can solve it. As, as exercise, you can solve it. What is the moment of inertia of a uniform sphere of radius r if the axis of rotation is found at the rim or at the surface of uh, the, uh, the sphere? So try this, please. Okay. The other point is, suppose if you have a combination of system, here you have different mass and a bar as well. So to find the moment of inertia of such systems, as the axis is found either through center or it might be at one of the mass, so it's possible to find the moment of inertia as well. You can solve this. Let's assume that the axis of rotation is through center and the bar has mass m, it is 2 kilogram. Uh, here it says what is the moment of inertia of uh, point mass system. Here you have a point mass system. And the mass, suppose in the first case, you can consider this road as massless. At some other case, it's possible to take a certain mass of the road. So here you have uh, 2 kilograms, 4 kilograms, and 6 kilograms, two mass with different mass. The bar has 2 kilograms. In the first case, it's possible to say massless. Let's assume that it is massless. 
If it is massless, the only thing you are consider is the two mass. Therefore, the moment of inertia appears due to the mass two and mass one. Therefore, the moment of inertia of these two systems, if the rod is massless, you can consider it to be m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared. This is, uh, you can consider it as a system of particles or particle system. If this bar has a mass, if this bar has a mass, you should have to consider the moment of inertia of the bar itself. And we have said that the moment of inertia of a bar as the axis of rotation is through center, you should have to use 1 over 12 m l squared. Okay? And instead of those two particles, in addition to those two particles, you should have to use this one. So you have to practice those examples. Now let's try to see the other terms. Previously, you have said that in rotational dynamics, we have two key terms, the moment of inertia and torque. Torque is also known to be the moment of force. So what is torque or moment of force? Torque is a vector quantity which is measures the turning effect of force. Force has so many effects. Among the effect, one is to bend or turn objects. So the turning effect of force is known to be moment of force or torque. And mathematically, it's expressed as the moment arm, or you can call it displacement, times uh, cross product, should be cross product times force. So displacement times force in a cross product gives us torque. Previously in work, you have learned that the product of force dotted with displacement S gives us a vector, a scalar quantity known to be work. So since it is dot product, the result is a scalar. Work is a scalar. Both quantities are force and displacement. They are vectors. It's a dot product. But in this case, we are trying to deal with cross product. Actually, moment R is displacement. So the cross product of these two force, these two quantities or vectors, gives us another vector. Cross product result in vector. And that vector is known to be moment of force, or we call it to be torque. So force times R, when you are trying to determine the magnitude, sine theta. In this case, theta is the angle between the force and the moment arm. What do you mean by moment arm? Moment arm is displacement or distance between the pivotal point or the hinge point to that of a place where you exert a force. Suppose here you have a wrench and here you have a bolt. Exactly at the point bolt, you have a pivotal point. And the force here exerts in this direction. You have a force acting on this direction. And the axis, uh, the moment arm is the distance between these two, the pivotal point and the place where the force is exerted. The distance between these two is known to be uh, moment arm R. And the moment arm R times the force. And the angle here, it says the distance between the moment arm. You can uh, elongate this. So that this is a moment arm, unit vector location. You can locate it like a unit vector and a force. The angle between the force and the moment arm is known to be theta. You should have to use the sine component of theta. For a maximum torque to be happened or to be exerted on a given object, theta should be 90. Suppose here you have the range or any given bar. And here you have a pivotal point. Let's say that here you have the point, pivotal point. And the force exerted here is this one. And the moment arm and the force had 90 degree. Okay? If they have 90 degree, theta is 90. Sine theta gives us 1. Sine 90 gives us 1. And that gives us the maximum torque. So torque maximum can be given as F times R. Sine 90 gives us 1. So F times R is maximum torque. This is the maximum possible torque exerted on a given rotating object. Now let's try to determine the torque or moment of force on a given object. Here you'd have a given object. Let's assume that here you'd have a mass hanging on a bar. What is the moment of force or torque produced by 10 kilogram mass? Okay, hanging at one end of the bar of 4 kilogram. Here the bar itself has a mass and it's 4 kilogram. 
Now the question is, what is the torque produced only by mass? Which mass? The weight here. Look here, it has mass m is equal to 10 kilogram. It has its own weight and the weight is acting downward. Weight is equal to mass times gravity. So that we have 100 Newton force is exerted downward. Okay, the angle between the bar and from horizontal is 53 degree and the distance from the pivotal point to this point, the point where the weight, the load is exerted is 4 meter. Now the question is, what is the moment of inner, the moment of force or torque exerted by this force or this weight? Well, to find torque tau is equal to R cross F. R cross F means uh, you should have to use the magnitude of the force, the magnitude of the moment arm, sine theta. What is the angle between the moment arm and the force? What is the angle between this moment arm and the force? The force is acting downward, so what is theta? That's the question. So to find theta, here you draw 53 degree from horizontal, so you can project it downward. Therefore, theta gives you 37 degree. This is 90, this is 53, then this angle theta is 37 degree. So we can use this angle. Therefore, tau is equal to F times R sine theta. The force exerted by the weight is 100 Newton, and the distance between the pivot and the location where the force is exerted is 4 meter. So 100 times 4 sine 37. And this gives us 214 Newton meter. By the way, the SI unit of torque is Newton meter. The SI unit of uh, torque is Newton meter. And previously, we have the same expression for work. We have said that work is equal to force times displacement. The SI unit of work, the SI unit of work is given to be the SI unit of Newton. Uh, force is Newton, the SI unit of displacement is meter. But this Newton meter was called to be joule. We call it to be joule, okay, J. And one joule is equal to one Newton per meter. But in this case, even though we have a Newton per meter, it's not called joule, okay? Because this is appears from cross product and this appears from dot product. So the dot product one is the result that's called joule. But in this case, we just put it to be Newton meter, no more equivalent expression. So it is 214 Newton meter. This is how we use uh, the torque. The torque exerted by the weight, it's possible to find this way, or it's also possible to find the torque exerted by the bar itself. The bar has four kilogram on itself. Exactly at center, it's possible to exert 40 Newton. Okay, 40 Newton. The distance between the pivot and here is half of the length of the bar, and it's going to be two meter. The angle still remains 37, so you can find the moment of inertia of the bar, only due to the bar the moment of uh, force exerted or the torque exerted by the weight of the bar can be calculated as 40 Newton times 2 meter times sine 37. It's possible to find like that. And at last, here we have the equivalent representations of rotational dynamics. In, rota in linear dynamics or translational dynamics, you have learned that it's possible to use the law of acceleration for a given translational objects, or it might be a system, a constraint system, and so on. We have, it's possible to apply the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. The equivalent representation of rotational dynamics can be expressed, or the law of acceleration can be expressed in rotational dynamics as the equivalent representation of net force the analogy of force in rotational motion is called torque. And the analogy of mass in rotational motion is known to be moment arm. We can call it, use capital I. And the analogy of a linear acceleration for rotational uh, motion is known to be angular acceleration. So we can find this as mass times acceleration or it's possible to use F net is equal to mass times acceleration. But you know that it's possible to multiply both sides by radius r, or it's possible to say you have a linear acceleration. Linear acceleration can be related as uh, r times alpha, r times alpha, meaning radius r times angular acceleration. 
So let's try to multiply both sides by radius r. Why are we multiplying by radius r? For rotational dynamics, you should have to have radius r, and there will be a net exerting force here. So force times r gives us torque. Let's try to multiply both sides by r. So when you multiply force by r, and here you have mass and acceleration, mass times acceleration times radius r. Instead of acceleration, you can put that r times angular acceleration. So mass times okay, linear acceleration can be expressed as alpha times r times r. And force times r is known to be torque. We have already previously expressed it, torque tau. And here, r times r gives us r squared, mass times r squared times alpha tau. So mass times r squared is a general definition of moment of inertia. So torque can be expressed as moment of inertia times alpha. So the equivalent expression of rotational dynamics or law of acceleration can be equivalently expressed as I times alpha. So students, this is all that I've got for today. Next time, we'll try to discuss and solve some additional problems on rotational dynamics. So bye-bye.